Good morning, and thank you, uh, Shireen. Today we're going to discuss a really, really important topic, and in my opinion, this topic about you know relocalization and regionalization is gaining recently a lot of momentum. And the title of this plenary is about relocalization and regionalization cooperation in increasing shock-prone global economy. Yes, the dynamic, the, the global dynamic is changing, and even the political tension is changing. And changing due to the rise of the right wings, the disruption in the supply chain, and and in many aspects also it's 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 this polarization in addition to the pandemic but also recently on 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 the issues uh, re related to the trade tension so all these if you put it on the together we're going really into a new dynamism and environment when it comes into the global economy i remember 30 years ago all the Western countries was promoting globalization. And they say this is the way forward. And all the academia, the policymaker was going toward that the globalization was the key. Then recently we find that, you know, localization and regionalization is, is the way. And we can see these grouping is coming out of this a new thinking and the new environment. Today we have four distinguished uh, speakers, which really they put a lot of thoughts into this topic. We have with us half of Ghanim. He is from the Brookings Institute and Policy Center for the New South. And he was also the vice president for the MENA region, which I remember I worked with half of, he was promoting the regional integration. And as you know, the least integrated region globally, it's the MENA region. So he was putting one of the main focus of the MENA strategy about the regionalization. Bernard Hockman from the Uni European University Institute. Majid Al Munif, King Abdullah Petroleum Studies and Research Center. Leila Baghdadi. Uh, I have it here, Leila, but University of Tunis, but she's now with the Chief Economist of MENA of the World Bank. So she works there. And uh, Ariane Dehan from the International Development Research Center, IDRC. And uh, Ariane is going to be connected online. He is in Delhi. Uh, why don't I start with you, Hafiz, and then I go to the list, uh, the, the, the order of the list. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Merza. And uh, I do have a, a presentation, which I do not see. Ah, it's here. Excellent. Uh, th uh, thank you. <laughs> so let me start the presentation by uh, underlining something that Merza said. Uh, this here is a quote from a recent article that I just read last week from Maurice Opsfeld. And in, in that quote, I'm not going to read it for you, you, you can read it, but basically in that quote, uh, Opsfeld is saying, uh, w with all the shocks that we've been going through and looking at what's happening in the world today, it reminds me very much of the interwar period, the period right before World War II. So uh, the world is really looking very uh, da dangerous. Now, <coughs> we heard something along those lines the day before yesterday from Jeff Sachs. Uh, Jeff told us uh, that uh, this is the most dangerous geopolitical environment since, w since the World War. So, uh, so there seems to be, uh, no, that, uh, remove the seams, there is a consensus that, uh, we, uh, that this is a very uh, unstable uh, geopolitical uh, situation now and that the world is facing 
uh, huge risks. Uh, you know, if you look at the Russia-Ukraine situation, the US-China situation, th th those are situations that can lead into even much bigger wars. Uh, we see a lot of civil wars around the world, uh, including in our region, lots of civil wars in our region, and uh, 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 th those have become protracted civil wars. I in, in the good old days, the civil war would last maybe a year, but now, how long has the civil war in Yemen lasted? So those protracted civil wars, why are they protracted? Because they have become proxy wars between different powers getting involved in the country. Typically, a civil war will end when one side wins or when both sides get too tired or run out of money and run out of uh, ammunition. Uh, but if, if you have powerful neighbors involved on both sides of the civil war, it can continue for a very, very long time. And that is what we're seeing now. Uh, 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 Berza talked about populism and how it's impacting the world. I'm not going to go much uh, uh, into that. I don't have anything to add to what Mirza said. But the Israel-Hamas war is, uh, uh, has been added to the list of uh, 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 risks in, in the geopolitical situation. And it is, I mean, it for our region, obviously, it, it is the uh, uh, biggest risk. And I think going forward, one issue that I haven't heard people mention, which is how that war is impacting pe the people of, uh, of that region's view of the West in general. And uh, whether our relationship with the rest of the world, wi especially with the West, will be the same even after that war is over. I, I don't know, I, I'm putting that as a question because I hear I mean, not from leaders, but just from people on the street, uh, a lot of uh, uh, unhappiness and a lot of resentment uh, to what is going on. Uh, so, so that is um, uh, what, what is happening the, uh, on the global political front. And obviously, it has, ha ha it has had an economic impact. So, as, again, as uh, Merza said, the wo world is uh, breaking up into blocks. We're, we're going back to the, apparently to the Cold War period, where we're breaking up into blocks. Uh, according to the IMF, over the last uh, year and a half or two years, the trade between the different blocks have, has fallen by 5%. So we, we see a decline in trade. Actually, the trade within blocks has also fallen by two and a half percent. So w we see a shrinking uh, trade in the world, and who says shrinking trade, uh, it's also a lower growth. So growth, world growth has lost one percentage point. Now, what is also important for us is to see what happened to official development assistance. And official development assistance, if you go to the if, if, if you go to, uh, to the OECD DAC site and you look at the number of for ODA, say, in 2022, it is $204 billion, which is more or less what ODA has been uh, 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 on average. However, if you dig a little deeper, you will find two interesting aspects. Uh, first that uh, part of that ODA, what they call ODA, is now includes $29.3 billion of in-country refugee costs. So if a country, the UK is a good example, is taking in uh, refugees from Ukraine and settling them, this, and that has a cost, this is added in as ODA. Uh, and, and, that uh, and, and that is, close to $30 billion uh, worldwide. It also includes $16 billion of aid to Ukraine. So if you subtract all of that, what we call country programmable uh, aid is actually much less than the $200 billion. It's closer to maybe, uh, uh, it's less even than $150 billion. 
So although the overall number looks like ODA has been stagnant, actually with everything happening in the world, real ODA has been uh, uh, declining, declining quite uh, uh, sharply. And those of us who worked on Africa, for example, felt it a lot. Uh, now, uh, more serious even than the decline in ODA is the decline in uh, uh, foreign investment in, in, the, uh, uh, in emerging and uh, markets and developing economies. Uh, actually, we have all, we're all talking about the need to increase in, in, uh, direct foreign investment. Well, as people have been talking about that, the reality is in 2022, foreign direct investment in the uh, emerging markets and developing economies declined, but uh, was negative $125 billion. In 2023, it was negative $193 billion. So basically, over the last two years, in addition to falling ODA, there has been a, a, a an outflow of more uh, of close to 300, more than 300 billion dollars of f f direct uh, private capital out of uh, emerging uh, markets and developing economies. So, so this uh, so this is to tell you that all of that uh, of fragmentation and uh, uh, and uh, instability in the world has a real impact on developing countries in terms of finance. And of course, the result we see, I mean, you, you heard yesterday from Mahmoud, uh, <coughs> and you saw uh, that the impact uh, in terms of SDG, it's, it's not just our region that's not uh, achieving the SDGs, it's the whole world. There is no region in the world that is close to achieving the SDGs. Uh, climate, achieving the climate target, forget the Paris Agreement. We've, we're already passing the 1.5 uh, uh, degrees Celsius. I mean, we'll be lucky if we can keep the temperature increase below two degrees Celsius. So I'm sorry that I'm giving you all of this uh, negative picture, uh, but this is what we are facing, and that is where, what, why we need to prepare ourselves to deal with this situation. Now, there are two responses in the world. Uh, glo uh, calls for ref global re uh, reforms, trying, and the, the, the especially uh, the Secretary General of the UN is having, uh, is carrying out valiant efforts, I would say, to try to uh, revive multilateralism and enhance uh, 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 cooperation. And increasingly, we see those regional blocks building. And uh, as, as now we cannot rely on, an, anybody saw any recent agreement at the WTO? No, I don't think so. And I, I, I feel sorry for my friend uh, Ngozi, uh, who's uh, uh, leading that organization, because she's such a wonderful leader, she's wasted there. So uh, as the WTO is not moving, uh, uh, regional blocks are developing and especially we see a, a, a development in East Asia. Um, so let me start by looking at the, uh, uh, what's happening at the, uh, at the global level. There is the United Nations, the Secretary General issued a report uh, talking about, uh, our, uh, it's called Our Common Agenda, actually. You can find it on, online. Uh, that report has uh, uh, a lot of, uh, uh, reforms covering uh, al uh, many aspects, and it, uh, uh, it is going to be discussed at the summit that uh, uh, Mahmoud mentioned yesterday in Spain, which will be which is in September of this year. It's called the Summit of the Future. What is uh, interesting for us as a bunch of economists is that the part of that uh, common agenda which is focusing on the reforming the global financial ar uh, architecture. And uh, a part of it is looking at governance, how to enhance the voice of countries of the South in, in, uh, in the governance of institutions like the World Bank and the IMF. 
If I had more time, I would go into the details of that. Uh, he, uh, don't, no, no, no. <laughs> and then there is also uh, a lot of talk about increasing uh, financing for climate and for development, uh, which again, if I had more time, I would tell you that this is all talk and very little uh, as uh, so action. Uh, as, as we here uh, heard yesterday, uh, I, I think, or you mentioned it, Mirza. I mean, uh, there's. O o uh, I, I feel that the politicians are just kicking the can down the road. They'll say, you, you know, we need the world needs 2.4 trillion dollars a year for the in the global south, excluding China, f as climate financing, and we have 61 uh, climate funds in the world. Uh, multilateral climate funds in the world that disperse about two to three billion dollars a year. So look at the difference. And now they're telling us, oh, don't worry, the World Bank will finance it. How will the ba World Bank get 2.3 trillion dollars? And are we going to rechannel money that's going to development to health and education uh, that Roberta was talking to us about yesterday to uh, to do climate mitigation? So anyhow. Uh, uh, so uh, now, now I, I'm going to talk about the. Uh, given all of that, uh, uh, I'll talk quickly about the regional cooperation uh, in, in in our region. I will be fo focusing on the Arab countries, but uh, in some aspects, I will be talking also about the importance of including uh, Turkey uh, and Iran. Uh, and I, I will just mention. Uh, that regional cooperation in the Arab world. I'm an old man. I remember days from Nasser and so on, Arab unity, we, and nothing has worked. And as uh, Merza said, it is the least integrated region in the world. Uh, what I am proposing is maybe to look at regional cooperation in a different way. I, I, I suggest that there are three existential threats facing this region and that we need to cooperate in order to meet those existential threats. The three existential threats are fragility and conflict, uh, climate, water and food security, and jobs for, for the uh, 100 million young people who will be coming over the next 10 years. Uh, so uh, dealing with conflict and fragility, quickly, uh, if, you, if you look at the list of the members of the Arab League, there are 22 countries. Eight of them are failed or failing states. I, I, can, I can list them for you if, if you want to know. It starts with pa pa pal palis Palestine, Syria, Lebanon, I I Iraq, uh, Ye Yemen, uh, Sudan, uh, <laughs> Libya, uh, and, and finally, uh, all, also Somalia. So, uh, and the others are not doing that well. I mean, w we have uh, countries facing serious uh, macroeconomic imbalances, uh, Tunisia and Egypt. So, uh, that is, so quickly, what, what, what we, we need to cooperate to deal with this situation. Uh, and that's where it is important maybe uh, uh, if, uh, if I were president of the region, I, I, would, I would call a summit where uh, we, get, we sit together all the heads of state of the region with uh, Turkey and Iran uh, to agree on how to end those, uh, those situations. Because if you look into details, into each one of those cases, these are proxy wars. And it's amazing because two countries could be on the same side in one war, in Libya, for example, but on the different side in another war, in Sudan. Somebody has to explain this one day. I, I'm looking at Noha because she's a political scientist. She, maybe she can tell me <laughs> oh, if there is logic behind that. Once, but there is a need to, to, uh, to agree. This is crazy, what's going on. I mean, Sudan is heartbreaking. And, and we don't even hear people talking about it anymore. Uh, once the politics uh, is uh, uh, politics is, is, is resolved, I, I suggest that uh, 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 people read a couple of articles uh, that Ibrahim al-Badawi wrote with a co-author on dealing with the situation of civil strife, w and that includes the need for building inclusive institutions that would resolve conflicts and uh, increasing development aid and financing and investments.
quickly, the mother of all conflicts in our region, obviously, is Palestine. And we, uh, uh, two issues that I would like to raise, I, I mentioned them before. We, we, ca we cannot wait for the rest of the world to uh, uh, say uh, we accept a Palestinian state. We need to build a Palestinian state right away. Uh, you said it, Mirza, the other day that uh, in Palestine uh, we have institutions, at least in, in when, we were, when, when we were doing projects in West Bank and Gaza, we, we worked with institutions that actually built uh, projects and successfully. The problem o obviously is also at, at, the, at the senior political level. You need to de uh, resolve the, you, you, we cannot continue giving the Israelis this opportunity of saying, I have no credible counterpart. Somehow we need to, this needs to be resolved. The Palestinians themselves need to resolve it, but the rest of the region needs to have them. Rebuilding Gaza very quickly. Yes, once this war is over, we have to rebuild Gaza, but I've been to Gaza many, many times. And I, I, I would tell you, if you're going to rebuild the same old Gaza, it is a waste of time because it would explode again. Uh, you cannot rebuild an open air prison. So there has to be an agreement on uh, uh, movement of people, movement of goods and services and so on. And uh, I, I remember w when I was at the World Bank doing projects in Gaza, the biggest problem was, was getting the material for the project through the Israeli checkpoints. There has to be some kind of agreement on that. So, the other, other point, uh, he, he tells me I have a minute. There's no way. So, uh, you, don't you don't like what I'm saying. <laughs> so, uh, uh, so, so uh, climate change, but this is very important. This is really existential for the region. The, the, the most uh, water poor region in the world, and it's going to get even poorer. We have, and, and the, the water scarcity is leading also uh, to, uh, f f we did talk about food security the last two days. I just want to underline that, that we have 13% of the population of that region who are undernourished. If you look at the conflict countries, the number is nearly double, it's 24% of the population is undernourished. We have 15% of children who are stunted. Uh, so this is not something that we, uh, I, I, that's why, and it's going to get worse. Because with climate change, with population growth, it, 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 is, it is going to, uh, to get worse. And if we don't resolve all of those conflicts, and if we don't do something about it, uh, uh, so, <coughs> Need to have that is an area where we need regional cooperation. I, I'm not going to go through all of my list. I have wonderful suggestions, but Merza does not want me to tell you about them. <laughs> <laughs> the other uh, uh, is uh, uh, obviously uh, jobs, and in the jobs agenda, I, I, I know my other colleagues on the, on the, on the panel will talk about. Uh, the need to, wor to work on uh, uh, digitalization or, 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 or on, on the energy side and so on, so I'm, I'm not going to go into that. But I'm going to mention just one thing, Merza, if you allow me, which is the uh, importance of education. Uh, we need to, uh, uh, because Roberta also could not go into education yesterday, uh, our, our education systems in, 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 in the region are failing. Uh, and it's very, very dangerous because we have people who, who, who finish school, who go into universities, and, and they have a degree. They feel that the society owes them jobs. I mean, they spent money, their families, uh, they studied, their, their families uh, sacrificed for them to do all of that. But in the end, their degrees do, do not mean much because they haven't learned the skills that are needed in the labor market. So unless we really fix that, so th 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 those people are ve very, very disgruntled. Th they feel uh, uh, that society has failed them. And uh, in, in, uh, in a study I did like five years ago or something, uh, that is the majority uh, of people who, uh, who, who become uh, radicals uh, and uh, violent extremists. 
So it is really an issue that is very important. Uh, this, uh, this is the list of uh, everything I talked about. There is, I talked about the reforming global institutions. I did not talk about reforming regional institutions for one good reason, which is that the chair of this panel uh, knows much more about regional institutions than I. So I did not dare get into the subject, but I would suggest maybe Mirza, you might want to talk to us about the regional financial institutions. Thank you very much. No, thank you. Thank you, Hafel. Uh, honestly, uh, colleagues, you know, we are tired. We need peace. One. If today we are in conflict, I will assure you the next conflict is going to be over water. So that's something which we need to take care of it today. By 2050, this region needs to create 450 million jobs, and we are not even close to 5% of that. So when there is no job, there is no peace, no security. And you know the power of the youth uh, when they are undermined. So thank you, Hafid, for bringing all these. Uh, and yes, we need to major reform of our regional institutions and collaborations to put a dent when it comes to the development. I totally uh, agree. Half of the look, you, you, you shared on many important uh, things, and, and uh, this regionalization and localization also it has an opportunities, but also challenges would come with it. So I hope we can see these, op by localization, we can see some opportunities by creating more jobs and bringing the supply chain closer to home. That's all is going to be an additive to this new dynamic. Uh, let me move to our next speaker, Bernard. Great. Thank you. Well, it's a pleasure to be part of this panel. I'm Unfortunately, I was not able uh, to travel to be with you, so we have to do it through online. But I guess one of the good things about the COVID experience is we're now used to hybrid meetings. Uh, let me just share my screen. Okay. So, um, let me not repeat what I think has probably been said before in other sessions, and, and Hafez has also given a good uh, kind of introduction in the situation we're in, right? So lots, Lots of international shocks, recurring international shocks, which are not going to end, as, as was just emphasized by, by Nersa, and a lot of regional uh, shocks. And I think it's it's clear that everybody would agree that if we can create a situation where we're addressing or reducing regional differences and conflicts, that at least would attenuate a major source of the adverse shocks that are affecting the economies and polities of countries in the region and the associated disincentives for investment. So I thought what I would do uh, in my 15 minutes here is, is to focus on the question, which is a bit different, I think, from, from some of the other things that um, you may have been talking about, is whether the shift in focus, which is partly geopolitics, but it's more than geopolitics, towards a much greater uh, concern with national and economic security among the, the global um, economic powers, whether that offers opportunities to the region, countries in the region, to also attenuate these regional sources um, of conflict, right? So you all know the international context, and I think there's a lot of focus, of course, on geopolitics. Uh, Hafez had a very nice summary of all the major international sources of tension and changes. The one thing I would add to that is, in addition to all of this focus on the geopolitics, US-China tensions, Russia's war against Ukraine, um, and so forth, there's also a trend where there's, I think, an increasing focus in, in large economic players like the European Union, but I think also in the United States, where the focus is more on safeguarding and attaining domestic values, which are reflected in domestic regulation. And what we're seeing today is, is a mix of a focus, which is all about de-risking supply chains, which is partly translated into reshoring and localization. But in practice, I think is much more reflected 
in increasing diversification of where companies and countries are sourcing from. So I don't think we're seeing a big shift away from kind of global uh, exchange and global integration. It's it's very much more a change in the structure of that uh, patterns of specialization. But there's also an increasing focus on making sure that products that are traded actually satisfy domestic regulatory norms uh, and standards. On top of that, we see now an increase in competition in terms of a subsidy war or a subsidy race by the large players, which is really focused on trying to create greater production of the goods and potentially also services that are needed to maintain a high-tech uh, competitive industry. And that is translated into a lot of focus on where are we going to be sourcing the critical materials from uh, minerals, uh, essential supplies. You also saw that in the COVID pandemic for the things that are needed in order to satisfy uh, domestic needs, but also the transition to a green economy. So that is, as you all know, reflected in, in subsidies for electric vehicles, batteries, semiconductors, and so forth. Now, one implication of, of ongoing trends in terms of these focus, the change in focus away from, from, from economic in exchange and integration towards realizing what I've called non-economic objectives, in particular values, is that if you put that on top of the geopolitical rivalry and tensions that have been increasing, as Hafez mentioned, there's a real shift away from multilateral cooperation. So it's very difficult to conceive of China, the United States, the European, let alone Russia, getting around the table and agreeing with all the other countries in the world on how to deal with kind of managing the spillover effects of national measures that are being taken where trade and investment is being used as, as, a, as a lever to achieve non-economic objectives. And clearly the, the mother of the non-economic objectives at the moment is national security, but much more I think prevalent is a sense that we need to increase economic security. And that's certainly the case in the European Union. Now that's that's been an ongoing trend that has been reflected. The, the, the difficulty of getting to yes, at the multilateral level has been translated for a long time now in preferential uh, agreements, preferential trade agreements. And those preferential trade agreements have increasingly become deeper in terms of addressing all kinds of domestic regulatory uh, issues. I think one of the changes that we've seen in the last few years, which is very important, is an increasing resistance to this approach towards integrating markets. And there's a very interesting bifurcation now where the United States is saying, no, we don't want to go down this path anymore. In fact, we'd rather reopen agreements we have negotiated in the past. And essentially, the United States is adopting a position that India has been taking for many, many years which is we need and want policy space, which translates into we will not make binding market access commitments, which are enforceable through dispute settlement, which for a long time was kind of the major source of comparative advantage for the WTO. <laughs> At the same time, we see the rest of the world or large parts of the rest of the world continuing down the track of deep trade agreements, right? Africa is an example in the African continental free trade area. East Asia has become the leader uh, in this area, negotiating mega regional trade agreements like the Comprehensive and Progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, and so forth. And the interesting thing about those developments is that China has actually signaled that it, it is willing to actually participate in these types of agreements. So. That kind of goes in the direction of Hafez was talking about block formation uh, and blocks becoming kind of more distinct. At the same time, I would point to an increasing willingness uh, of countries to say, well, these blocks are not the be all and the end all, right? So the United States is now very, very clear in that point, but I think many countries have come to the conclusion that there's a lot that can and should be done, which should be done through more variable geometry through more flexible arrangements, right? And th those are issue specific, those translate into issue or domain specific, either bilateral 
or plurilateral agreements. And we see those things proliferating, especially in regions that are firmly committed to further integration of markets, i.e. Uh, East Asia. You see that in digital economy partnership agreements. You also see it reflected in the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, which is something that the US has been uh, supporting, um, and which do not revolve around trade agreements, right? They're, they're trying to deal with a particular issue. They're trying to en encourage regulatory convergence cooperation in a specific area. And we're also seeing it now in terms of a potentially um, critical uh, plurilateral agreements on essential supplies, critical materials. You also see this in the WTO. So I think what we're seeing is a trend away from traditional trade agreements towards plurilateral forms of cooperation that deal with issues where subsets of countries have shared interest, common concerns, and are willing to cooperate with each other in achieving them. So that's not multilateral, but it's certainly not bilateral either. And, and the key distinction here is it's not premised on deep trade agreements. Now, the question is, do these developments that we see externally, do they offer an opportunity for their region? And I think, as Afez also mentioned, and I'm sure others have mentioned in the conference, there are lots of those potential opportunities. <laughs> so one is, if you want to get out of China or you want to diversify away from China, where do you go? Right. So that creates an opportunity for the region to say, well, investors who want to kind of relocate some of their production or parts of their supply chain to uh, countries, uh, whether it's because they want to get out of China or whether it's because they want to get closer to their customers, you know, there are clearly opportunities for the region there, right? So the Maghreb countries as a location for global value chain production, targeting the European Union and the African markets, the GCC countries, of course, have already gone very far down this path, very successfully creating huge logistics, transportation services hubs, which could also become then platforms for production to Africa, to the European Union, to Asia. So that's one example. Another example is as a supplier of clean energy, natural resources, right? And clearly there's a huge focus in the European Union for one, thanks to the war that Russia launched against the Ukraine, to have more secure and diversified access to gas. Uh, there's potential for electricity, trade, and there's a huge interest in getting access to critical minerals. So there are therefore opportunities to cooperate in those areas to both satisfy that demand, but at the same time also create economic benefits and opportunities for, for the countries in the region. And there are already a lot of initiatives in some of these areas. And I think the questions we need to ask also from a research point of view, where do you need regional cooperation as opposed to national uh, initiatives? Or where do you need to form cooperative arrangements with countries that are outside the region, right? So there's been a lot of focus on regional cooperation as such among Arab countries. But in practice, I think in many of these areas, you need to involve either the major markets outside the region or major suppliers of technologies, finance, what have you, that are also going to be coming from outside the region. Another question is, can plurilateral cooperation, which is issue-specific, domain-specific, help overcome regional divisions and, and the conflicts that we're seeing and have been seeing for a long time by generating meaningful increases in economic activity and, and employment, as opposed to simply generating rents, more foreign exchange, which are not really benefiting the economy a lot. And a third question to ask is whether plurilateral forms of cooperation that are dealing with a particular issue where there are shared interests does that need to be embedded in a well-functioning trade agreement? And these are not questions I necessarily have answers to, but I think that is there's a research agenda there, which is, which is important. Now, we all know that on the deep integration front, the Arab world has not done particularly well. We have the pan-Arab free trade um, area, which in fact has greatly reduced tariffs. Uh, has done a much better, but has not done such a good job on non-tariff, on non-tariff measures. But I think the one key point I think I want to make here is the shift that you see towards plurilateral cooperation among countries to facilitate trade. 
that we're seeing both in and outside the WTO with respect to e-commerce, with respect to domestic regulation of services, to facilitate investment. There's limited participation by countries in the region in those international initiatives, right? So aside from the GCC, um, which is actively participating in some of these deals and, and, and talks in the WTO, other countries are simply not engaged in this at all. And I think personally, I think that is a mistake, but I think it's an interesting factoid. And the question to ask is, why is that the case, right? And the absence of this type of cooperation, integration, focusing on, on, on regulatory measures, uh, you see that reflected in the in, in the uh, in the performance of the region in terms of regional value chains. And here, the stylized fact is is that although there has been great improvement in terms of intra-regional trade, sub-regionally in some areas, on average, the region has become more integrated with the rest of the world. So that trade is really going towards other markets. Uh, so you see that here in this graph, which I took from a paper that Jim DeMello and Anna Toom wrote a few years ago, where we're seeing that the Middle East North Africa is similar to Sub-Saharan Africa in terms of that integration through value chains being very much focused on integrating with the rest of the world, not within uh, the region. But the op you see the opposite in other parts of the world. Now, if you take that back, in an intra-regional integration sense saying, well, there actually are opportunities where we can build on what already has been happening in terms of further integration with major markets in the rest of the world. So just to very quickly talk about, given that I don't have a whole lot of time and I can share this, this presentation in terms of what are some of the opportunities for this variable geometry plurilateral type of cooperation among regional countries, right? So. There are many, and Hafez mentioned a bunch. I will mention a few more here, and they range from economic car corridors to regional connectivity and integrating markets for energy, cooperating to increase access to fresh water, desalination linked to renewable energy investments, facilitating regional tourism, and so forth. And, and what I want to just spend two or three minutes on is just going through a number of these initiatives that are already being proposed and some of which are already being implemented. So one deals with economic corridors and connectivity projects. And clearly there is a big dimension of the geopolitical situation lurking in the background here. But a good example, an interesting example is the India, uh, Middle East, EU economic corridor that was proposed in, in the last uh, G20 meeting that was hosted by India. And the idea here is to build a rail corridor from the UAE through to the Mediterranean, uh, going through Saudi Arabia and Jordan, and to tie that also to <clears throat> improving digital connectivity through cables and, and laying a pipeline, which could potentially then transport clean hydrogen or, or gas to markets in the East Mediterranean and in the European Union. And Clearly, this is very early days, um, and clearly success requires quite a lot in terms of mobilizing financial financing, sustaining cross-border regional cooperation. But I think it's an example of essentially pursuing what the regional integration has been about, which will require a lot of regulatory cooperation, convergence, uh, a common regulatory institution to manage this infrastructure. But it might be easier to do this and it seems to be an alternative approach to this broad-based trade agreement-based uh, integration. Now, clearly, the feasibility of realizing this is going to be conditional on settling the war in Gaza, uh, and it's not going to happen anytime soon. But I think it's an example of the, the drive towards both uh, economic activity and economic uh, promotion of economic activity in the region, but at the same time, leveraging the desire of countries outside the region to diversify, right? So clearly this one reason for this is, is to provide an alternative route to the Suez Canal. Clearly that's not gonna be necessarily beneficial for Egypt, 
But again, from the buyer side, from, from, the, from the transport side, you can see a clear uh, incentive for these types of economic corridors and infrastructure investments to help diversify sources of supply while at the same time generating economic activity and benefits along these various corridors. Now, the corridor notion is, of course, by no means a new one. We have that in Europe. There's a lot of focus on, on, on road corridors uh, in Africa, but I think it's an interesting example of the type of regional plurilateral arrangement, which includes cooperation by non-regional countries that maybe could help uh, move the needle. Connecting uh, electricity markets is an ex another example, right? So there is a League of Arab States initiatives on a pan-Arab electricity market, which has been put in place, which is now in the process of being implemented. This is a very long-term project, but it's all premised on integrating markets for electricity, fostering trade, and potentially therefore also increasing the ability for countries to realize economies of scale, to invest less in their own electricity infrastructure and potentially exporting electricity to, to other markets. So third example is a regional. Regional, it's on the gas, again regional, where there's uh, an East Mediterranean gas forum, which is again, Countries in the region working with major buyers, in this case, uh, Italy, France, are involved in this, this exercise. And it's, it's, it's a very nice example of plurilateral cooperation. Specific includes the relevant regulators, includes the private sector, and where the whole idea is to cooperate amongst a small set of players which have shared interests in terms of actually uh, moving forward in, in utilizing a particular resource. But there again, there are clear dimensions of geopolitics, foreign policy that needs to be managed. Um, but again, it's 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 what, what I would call green shoots. Right now, clearly the East Mediterranean is by no means a very large supplier of gas. We have much larger sources of gas in the region and the question is, should they be part of this or not? How do you incentivize that? But again, it's it's an indication that countries are moving in this direction of plurilateral cooperation, which is pragmatic and focuses on a particular issue or uh, agenda. Third potential area, and this is very much potential uh, for plurilateral cooperation relates to the really strong interest that exists in many countries now to safeguard access to critical materials minerals, essentially essential supplies. And there's a whole bunch of ideas that have been floated to create clubs of like-minded countries on critical raw materials. And this is something where, given that the region has great potential to supply uh, these, types of these types of materials, there is also potential for thinking about, okay, does it make sense to take up, for example, the EU proposal for a critical raw materials club and work with the EU, but do it in a way that the interests of the regional countries are much more front and center, as opposed to this being an EU initiative or a US initiative. Now, just to wrap up, there is a, you, you clearly see already nascent domain specific plurilateral trade facilitation related initiatives that have been proposed or that are actually in place um, in the region. Uh, many of them include non-regional countries, and I think that's an important feature and fact of this type of cooperation, which suggests you need to think beyond just regional as, as uh, countries in the region. And I think many of these areas require thinking very carefully and clearly about who should be involved and how does this relate to the big guys, China, uh, Iran, Russia, that are big players in some of these particular issue areas. Um, and that ideally should be brought in, but at the same time, there's also this, this opportunity to link uh, initiatives that these countries that are being that are being pursued by these countries, right? So in the BRICS context, and I think here it's interesting that a number of the countries in the region are now members of the BRICS. Uh, so part of the diversification and de-risking objective can be achieved through initiatives that involve, again, different constellation um, of countries. Now, there's a whole slew of very complicated and difficult, but also interesting questions 
relating to the distributional implications of different constellations of club-based uh, cooperation. Essentially, we're talking here about, you know, about clubs. Uh, many of the challenges that apply to the provision of regional public goods uh, apply here, and certainly to these large infrastructure projects, weakest link constraints, hold up problems, and so forth. But I think one of the key things that I would point out in terms of this, these approaches is that they require regulatory cooperation. They actually require dealing with some of the issues that have been very strongly opposed in the context of trade negotiations by countries in the region. But those antibodies may be much less strong if you're focusing on a particular issue where it's clear where the benefits are from realizing cooperation and where you're involving the actors within countries who are responsible for that particular sector, for that particular issue, as opposed to putting everything in a very broad-based agreement where you have many, many, many issues and many, many actors involved in <clears throat> implementing that, which explains why it's so difficult to move forward in terms of deep, deep trade agreements. So, and again, all of this is clearly conditional on um, dealing with the conflicts in the region, in particular, the Israel-Palestine. It needs a, an, an Israeli-Palestinian settlement in order to realize these, these nascent opportunities that exist. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Bertrand. And well said, you know, let me just summarize what, what Bertrand also mentioned about, you know, the issue of, you know, the local politician voice, which coming now of developing uh, the local economies, creating a new businesses and jobs, and creating a new wealth and opportunity. So that's what we are hearing more. But also what Bertrand mentioned about very important about, you know, the multilateralism at the stake at the expense of uh, you know regionalization and localization today the the bilateral aid is far far more than any multilateral but also by regionalization we're going to strengthen the skills of you know negotiation and quality of regulation so that's also a plus when it comes to the uh, regionalization i move to my next uh, speaker majid the floor is yours I had the advantage of hearing the past two speakers, so, so I had the advantage of changing my <laughs> comments to be in line with what they're saying, not repeating what they had. Uh, I have three uh, major issues to address. First, the uh, regional uh, integration, regional cooperation, and the re uh, localization issue and uh, last, the uh, energy transition and its impact on uh, the region. First, we seem that there is an overall agreement that the region is at its lowest point ever, maybe the past 50 years. Uh, the region is weak, crumbling, has, no, has not taken initiatives, uh, it's been out of history for the past 50 uh, or so years. The division that was given by the previous uh, uh, speaker of stable and relatively growing economies and unstable uh, conflict-ridden economies with uh, non-state actors uh, and actually some countries occupied by so many forces. So even the question of, so of sovereignty of some nations is a question of the, uh, now in the region. So in a situation like this, the question is you know, whether uh, economic integration or cooperation can work in an unstable environment or shall we wait until the political situation gets better and get resolved here and there? And some, sometime in the future, the, the political situation uh, uh, will get, uh, get better. Uh, this is one option. 
I think the other option to look at is that to look at the bright spots of the Arab integration history. Uh, I would like to remind the audience is that we, the, there was a period in the, in the recent Arab history that had witnessed uh, good levels of cooperation and integration. In the 70s, massive capital movement and labor movement within the region occurred. That was unprecedented in the history of the region for the past centuries. Also, in the 70s, many institutions were built to at least manage the flow of wealth and the flow of labor, uh, uh, labor movement and so on. We had the Arab Fund for uh, Social and Economic Development. We had the Arab Monetary Fund, the Arab Investment uh, uh, Authority, and so many other institutions that were built and they took us into the 70s. But from the 80s, and then in the early 80s, we had the GCC, uh, Cooperation Council, and they went on to establish, the, uh, they ended up with a, the customs union. But since then, thing is told. So we, since then, say the, the 80s, we've been having like lost decades, not. Uh, uh, so I suggest to look at the bright uh, and activate those institutions that are already in place and they, are, they have a proven uh, efficient and they had worked their way. When I looked at that uh, slide on the uh, grid, the electricity grid, hadn't it been for the work and the financing of the Arab Fund, you know, such uh, grids would not have uh, come through. Hadn't been for the GCC, we couldn't have had the uh, GCC grid, and so on. So to uh, try to empower such institutions, even in that transition phase, if the region or the complex of the uh, region F. And I would even recommend for the ERF to communicate the outcome of the work that is being discussed here in this year to those institutions that their main work is actually to, uh, to help the uh, region. So this is the first uh, point. I'd like also to take this opportunity. We've talked about conflicts and so on. I have reservation on using the term Israel-Hamas war. The term Israel-Hamas war is really not the term to use. Uh, the the, uh, the Israel-Hamas war is like if there is a war between two armies like Ukraine and Russia and so on. But it is a war on Gaza. That's what it uh, really is. Uh, so even in the deliberations to use, to use that terminology, and we see it every day, I, I don't think that it is even appropriate. Uh, but this is just a side uh, comment. The, uh, the second issue is in uh, real, uh, uh, localization. The, uh, it has two aspects. The first one is the global. Yeah. There is, of course, a, uh, the relocalization. Uh, if it means reducing the uh, uh, global value chain from away from China and into other regions, then it's actually switching. We are switching from China to others. And there are economies that are actually benefiting from that switching. Vietnam, Indonesia, uh, South Korea. Luckily, some of our economies are also uh, uh, gaining from this switching. 
uh, Morocco is gaining, I think, in one of the slides I, that I saw. Egypt is also will be benefiting. So in this particular part, there are economies that are situated to benefit from this switching uh, of the localization process. But there is another aspect of uh, uh, localization. It is to have localization as part of the industrial policy of the countries of the uh, region. Over the years, some countries have uh, built comparative advantage in some industries and so on. Uh, but they have not been able to capitalize on this. Uh, so countries have to uh, set uh, strategies for local uh, content and even institutions for local contents. Uh, for example, in Saudi Arabia, where I came from, we set out a strategy for local uh, uh, content and an agency, an authority, to uh, promote and to regulate uh, and to find the incentives for the uh, uh, localization, targeting certain industries. And they started with the uh, oil and gas industry because this is the oldest industry that we had. Uh, and I think, you know, after 70 or 60 years of having an industry, uh, uh, when we uh, we continue to have 75 percent of its pur purchases uh, from outside the region, so this is a uh, a mandate to uh, reduce the 75 to 20. Uh, uh, to 25 uh, uh, by promoting or uh, uh, backward and forward uh, linkages in that sector. Uh, the one of the slides that was uh, put here uh, on the sh shipbuilding, on the energy services industries, and uh, so on. That's where you can localize, but there will be challenges. And the uh, 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 ensuring competitiveness, productivity, and level playing fields between SOEs and the private uh, sector. This is this would be the main challenge of devising a strategy and implementing a strategy for localization. The uh, third issue is the uh, ongoing changes in uh, the world are where the uh, 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 region fits in. Slide six, I think, of uh, Hockman's uh, presentation tells it all. The WTO uh, recent talks on e-commerce, investment facilitation, and SMEs only some GCC countries and Morocco are participating. Those are important issues, and only of the whole region, those countries are uh, participating. I have noticed that even in, uh, we have had like 29 or 28 COPs until now, climate change. The only countries that are engaged in the negotiation uh, process climate change are the GCC, Egypt, and Morocco. So we don't have a uh, good presentation in the uh, climate change uh, forum. We should have uh, such. And this brings me to the uh, last issue of energy uh, transition. The, w the energy transition is going on, whether it will be slow, fast, bumpy, uh, smooth, uh, it is still uncertain. But it is there. Uh, investment in renewables and electric vehicles and efficiency and so on it will continue. The demand for fossil fuels will decline. Uh, the growth 
first, the growth of demand will decline, and even the demand might uh, decline. The extent is unknown. There are so many scenarios. The extreme scenario of net zero emissions of the IEA uh, projects a decline of something like 60 percent, a, a drop of 60 uh, percent in oil, and uh, less so for gas by the year 2050. This means uh, a decline in demand, decline in production, and probably rent. The or rent will decline, and uh, so the uh, or revenues, which has been leading the economies of the GCC and many oil exporters, will be impacted. Now, what should the, uh, those countries do? First, they should be part of the energy transition, not only witnessing it unfold, unfolding. Uh, the uh, countries should invest in as much as they invest in uh, maintaining capacity and improving the, uh, their industry, their energy industries, going into the uh, uh, complete value added of oil uh, and gas and petro petrochemicals, polymers, and uh, so on. They should have their own narrative of the energy uh, uh, transition. They should go on and invest also in renewables, promote the use of electric uh, vehicles, if needed, uh, uh, promote hydrogen, carbon capture and utilization uh, and so on. But they should be in the forefront, n not only witnessing the uh, transition unfolding. The last thing I've noticed from the presentation on the BRI and the uh, IMC, uh, that's the corridor, and the uh, bridge on the uh, road and uh, belt. I've noticed only singular countries. There are many countries in the region that are, they are excluded. They are not there. So even in the infrastructure initiatives that are being talked about, financed, promoted within BRICS or uh, uh, others, most of the countries of the region are excluded. Why? Because they don't have uh, still the forum, the uh, uh, regional platform to present uh, uh, themselves. So that's all what I have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Majid. And you, you mentioned something very important, uh, Majid, is about how are we going to transfer the underground wealth to overground wealth, you know, going for uh, the future, but uh, also, you know, what, what really the three so far speakers, Hafel, Bernand, and Majid mentioned, and Bernard showed, showed it in one of the slides, that our trade with other regions, other countries outside the region is higher than the region. It's all because due to the conflict and fragility. So the three agreed that we need peace. Leila, you can join this coalition of peace, you know, in, in your speech, you know. So the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Dr. Mirza. Well, I wish first to thank the Economic Research Forum for the opportunity uh, to, to be here and to be in this panel with such knowledgeable um, speakers. I will be very brief and I will speak about these terms that I found in the description of the panel um, deglobalization, uh, localization. All this seems very strange since myself, when I was at the university, you know, all the courses were about globalization and how we were, you know, a small word village and we can connect with everybody. And at the time, the, the word really looked bright. Now, I'm very surprised 20 years after 
things are going backward. And suddenly we went from um, globalization of industrial supply chain and the opportunities that could give some developing country, like some MENA countries and Tunisia, my home country, my country where I come from, the opportunities for this country to industrialize. And yes, they, they took the opportunity and they participated in the value chain. They were stuck at some point for some reasons and they were unable to go further, but they, at least they pulled this uh, base of supply chain. Then we went from this to regionalization and we had these hubs. We had the North America hub, the European hub, and the Chinese hub, with the MENA mainly integrated with the European hub. Then from that, today, we hear again about the need to deglobalize. Last year, we were speaking about fragmentation or deregionalization, and this year, we are speaking about localization. All this, while still all of us are reliant on Chinese industrial input. But with this localization trend, there is also a rec trade reconfiguration trend. And I read this uh, McKinsey Global Report Institute is viewed in, Ju in January 2024. And I wanted to share with you this outlook a little bit of where we are going. Then they explored the changing geometry of global goods using four measures, trade intensity, geographic distance, import concentration, and new measure of geopolitical distance. And they ident identified three groups of country. You have the Western group, the Eastern group, and the misaligned group. The main country, they are in the misaligned group, with other countries, China, Southeast Asia, and Latin America. This group, the misaligned, misaligned group, it accounts for 16% of exports, in sheer world exports, um, of critical goods, around 16% then. Then now two <laughs> scenarios were proposed where you have some advantage and some discontent. You have the scenario of fragmentation where there is more intra-Western trade. Then there is an increase in this trade and China will strengthen trade with the misaligned group. Well, here, there will be a significant, a significant drop between China, well, the Western group and the Eastern group, and some of the trade will divert to the misaligned group. But essentially, it will be imports of Chinese or Western and Israel inputs to the misaligned group. Then there is not really parts of trade that could be taken from this misaligned group. Second, you have the diversification scenario. In the diversification scenario, well, China will lose some of its world share in concentrated product, but will gain in other. In this loss, eventually, eventually the misaligned group could grapple some of this part. But to the condition that we know that they have an industrial base already there, uh, and they are already in the, in the supply chain. Then again, we come back to, to what I have been uh, hearing myself for years and years, and, but it is even more critical given the change underway. And of course, given all the challenges you uh, highlighted, Dr. Havas. Then with this, really the investment in productive capacities on, upsc on upscaling uh, human resources, um, investing in infrastructure are critical to eventually being in the misaligned group, we can eventually some, say some opportunities. Now, having this in mind, I try to imagine and try to tackle the second uh, uh, question in the description of the panel, is there some possibility for intra-value chain. And here, since I am in Morocco, and I am in I am Tunisian, I will focus on this part of the world, then North Africa. I tried, okay, what eventually will be possible in that case? Um, we know that in the region, in North Africa, we have two models 
of global value chain integration. Then you have countries in the forward um, participation model, Libya, Algeria, uh, Mauritania, where basically they are exporting raw materials, including gas. And you have the group of backward participation, these countries that were able to, given the fragmentation, regionalization, globalization um, process, they were able to gobble and build some of their industrial base and eventually export um, products with foreign content, uh, Egypt, Tunisia, and Morocco. Now, if we look to these three countries, and actually Tunisia and Morocco, they were able to even export some complex product, but if, when, when you look to this country, you see that actually Morocco is ticking all the boxes in, in a in a paper, actually, we wrote with uh, Shahir, we were able to see that actually Morocco is able to, to, to do all the investment needed to upgrade in the value chain, like the uh, investment in infrastructure, um, the port infrastructure, uh, road infrastructure, also thinking about human capacities and things like that. Then eventually, if we try to think about it, we can think that Morocco could be a leader in regional value chain. In products like agrofood, uh, petrochemical, well, phosphate, things like that, and automotive uh, electrical garment. As a matter of fact, two weeks ago, we heard that the biggest player in the electronic garment in Tunisia is opening its third factory in Morocco, in Tanjimet. And we could think, I'm trying to be a little bit optimistic here, we could think that this is a kind of regional value chain, but it's going business to business and not government to government or government to, to business. And this actually, this is big player in value chain, in government, in electrical uh, garment, and now it's in Morocco, third factory, and it's ready in global production network. We can see that there will be more and more movement like this in agro-food, for example, or things like that. Now, um, in terms of forward participation, energy seems to dominate the North uh, Africa landscape, and there are, it's, this is a really huge sector and cross-cutting sec sector, in the sense, and here already Dr. Almanif speak about this for the case of uh, Saudi Arabia, but in our case, we have also heterogeneous cancer. You have oil importing, oil exporting sector, and this is cross-sector cutting country in this uh, sector in the sense that it's really critical also to build, to have a bigger base in supply chain for all the manufacturing uh, products we are speaking about, but also important to rethink about it and to change it from forward to backward in order to have more derivative industries linked to this uh, energy sector. Here, it seems immature to think about Business to business, the regional value chain, is still you need to have the government and the conditions are not uh, right there. Now, um, of course, there are other opportunities that could maybe uh, give a push to this regional value chain with the African free continental trade agreement, but the, long, the road is still very long. And in the meantime, the usual suspects, the things that are needed to, to be done, they are still um, that there's, there's still a statu quo, we still have uh, tariffs, non-tariffs barrier, behind the border barrier, uh, we still have uh, problems in terms of roads uh, linking the countries um, of even the shipping industries, um, and we, most importantly, the institution here for regional integration, they are not working, and there is a need to rethink what other platform, more agile, adaptive to the uncertainty and the different shock that, are, um, that the region uh, went through. Then is there a platform for private, public sector, something that is more bottom down, bottom uh, to up than the other way around? Thank you very much. Thank you, Leila. Let me say one thing, uh, colleagues. We at the Arab Fund, we are writing a new strategy which is going to the implementation at the beginning of the year. The major, the major pillar of that strategy 
is going to be the regional integration. So we are open to any ideas, and this is where we're going to dedicate many of our resources to really promote regionalization. De-risking projects, you name it, you know. We, we started with what uh, Majid mentioned about, uh, you know, uh, the pan-Arab uh, electricity. Uh, we are doing these type of now corridors. We can see the increase of bilateral, but not regional. It's good. We have two neighboring countries are doing many of these good things. We want to enlarge it to the bigger. So that's what, honestly, our main strategy going to be for, and I'm open to any ideas, suggestions, uh, in order to promote that further. Ariane, uh, I'm almost reaching, you know, end of my uh, time uh, designated for that session, but I can go a little bit over because the topic is really interesting. I can see the, uh, the audience faces. So, Ariane, the floor is yours. Thanks very much. And thank you to ERF colleagues for inviting me uh, to be part of this uh, this conference. And I'm really sorry I'm not there with you in person. I'm actually speaking to you from, uh, from Dhaka in Bangladesh, where I'm attending a conference on the climate adaptation plan of least developed uh, countries. I'd first like to congratulate ERF for this anniversary conference and for the topic that has been uh, chosen and how ERF is facilitating this debate and research at such a critical time, uh, reflecting on development since the Arab Spring and of course now the war in Gaza and allow me to uh, uh, humbly uh, express my deepest grief for the events in Gaza and for the way the international community has remained at best a bystander and, and equally important course, we should remember the, the other wars, the war in Sudan. And again, I want to commend ERF and, of course, Dr. Ibrahim El Badawi for continuing to support researchers uh, there, a very, very important role that this network uh, plays. In the next few minutes that I have, I will focus on the role of research in the context of MENA and build on what my colleague and our regional director, Sam Al Bey, presented at the opening session uh, based on experience uh, of how IDC supports localized uh, research and 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 I hope that that the combination of localized research and and regional integration and, and, and even in the context of global Globalization uh, will make sense, and in that I refer to conclusions of a conference that ID or IDRC organized on doing research in what we then called fragile contexts. Whether that's the best term or not, I leave aside for the moment. First, I think it, it is important to stress why regional cooperation is uh, is important, even though it comes natural to this uh, form. Uh, as a European, uh, uh, the integration, uh, European integration with all its drawbacks did not only provide so many uh, new opportunities, including, for example, mobility of students, really, really important, but also remains an expression of an alternative of the wars that marked the first uh, half of the 20th century. Um, of course, uh, Professor Hochmann and others stressed the economic benefits of regional uh, integration. Uh, and I, I'd like to highlight the uh, recent ERF research that st stressed the potential for regional integration to mitigate the impact of external shocks, such, such as the war in Ukraine and its impact on food and prices. I'd also like to mention a regional research project by ERF, uh, led by Professor Divan, uh, who I believe is in the audience, uh, on the growing public debt crisis, a topic where most research and policy debates happen in the global north and global institutions. policy responses to growing physical strength. Professor Divan, of course, can tell you much more about this work. And while we did not do uh, any formal evaluation of a relatively uh, short project, uh, Professor Divan did find that this ty type of work, including the creation of a regional commission, did help to not only enhance understanding of this uh, common problem, but also to bring this theme into uh, public discussions. So I very much hope that the ERF and the research community continues to reflect uh, what kind of research is most uh, impactful in, uh, in, in the specific manner context. And for that, I'd like to share some of the conclusions, as I said, of a conference IDRC organized in March 2019 with some 60 experts. Some of the people in the audience will have been there to explore how research funders can support research and, uh, and research stakeholders. And I posted the link to one of the papers in the, uh, in the chat. Um, that conference agreed that there's a need for research, researchers and, and evidence to play an enhanced role in generating and promoting evidence for development in fragile uh, context. Based on their local experience, researchers working in often very difficult contexts do see opportunities for research communities to, to make a difference. 
And of course, uh, that context in MENA that is very uh, diverse uh, and varies from situation of post-conflict emergency, where, build, for example, building of social services is a research priority, where research can make a difference, to context of potential conflicts, where, for example, perceptions research can be crit critical, and, and of course, author authoritarian context where the focus of research needs to include enhancing our accountability and addressing citizens' vulnerability. Uh, notwithstanding manifold, manifold contexts and hence priorities, experts all highlighted that research needs to put people at the center, their vulnerabilities, rights and aspirations, and diversity, including gender and ethnicity. And this is where, where people highlight that, and we strongly believe that research in such fragile contexts need to be localized as politics and fragility ma manifest themselves in context-specific forms at the, at the very local level. Of course, challenges of doing research, of influencing policy and practice in such contexts are not unique or fundamentally different, but they are amplified and intensified. Uh, therefore, it, it's very important to choose tailored approaches in all aspects of the research uh, process and in, in the work that we see here at the, uh, does. Uh, we, we see many of this being applied. So let me quickly mention uh, five of those. Um, first, fragile context are marked by, uh, of course, by lack of poor quality data and hence exploring innovative data is, is, is a great opportunity or, or a priority rather uh, as, is sure, as is ensuring the quality and ethical procedures around that. Um, the conference emphasized the need for localizing research, as I mentioned, as fragility manifests itself and causes and inequalities need to be understood in local contexts. Local actors should lead in implementing policy research, engaging with local communities. At the same time, uh, research on, on macroeconomic policies, trade policies, and linking this to local development is key for promoting sustained change. Of course, thirdly, low research capacity, a lack of appreciation of evidence, concentration of research in, in locations that, that are easier access, and, and the decontextualization of experiences of, of particular groups were highlighted as key concern. And there's a need for applying high standards for appropriate and context-specific methods, innovative data, and also research uh, context. And finally, fragile contexts are, are, are marked by strong north-south imbalances in knowledge generation. Localized research as well as evaluations can help enhance the capacity for strong applied research and, and partnership need to be in line with that, need to be constructed in a way that allows local researchers to set and implement uh, agendas. These are by no, I know, by no means easy challenges for the research community, but if such a research agenda feels challenged, Challenging, it's merely because the world around us, around you, is, is challenging. Uh, research of the past has helped address uh, development challenges, and I remain confident that collectively we will continue to innovate and find ways to do so in future. So I conclude thanking again EREF for inviting me. Uh, it's an honor to, to be part of this community, and I want to express my deepest appreciation to all colleagues that continue to dedicate their careers to work in, in often difficult and hence such important contexts. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, Ariane. I did, I, indeed, I agree with you on the role of data and the local research in developing good quality policy. Uh, let me open the floor only for... Shireen, do I have time? Yeah, okay, just one... Uh, Uh, sorry, just to observe that the following sessions are going to be starting on schedule. So okay. we're going to be eating in from the coffee time. Just two, two to three sure. maximum Thank questions, you. please. Okay, uh, I moved to uh, Beirut, Lebanon in 2018 to join the American University of Beirut. And during that time, right at the beginning, I came across a very interesting working paper written by researchers at Birzeit University uh, in the West Bank, Palestine. Now, the title of the paper is Young Gazelles and Aging Turtles, okay? And this is to describe the business environment in the MENA. In other words, what they're arguing is, they were talking about employment growth, <coughs> but I think it uh, applies more generally to this discussion of, you know, integration, value-added chains, uh, development of industrial base. You have aging turtles. Okay? You have regulatory barriers. 
you have a big public sector and the young gazelles are not able to move fast. In other words, I think what needs to be discussed, uh, the underlying discussion of all this, you know, delocalization, re regionalization, value added chains, is liberalizing the MENA. There are too many. Uh, look at Egypt. I'm sure it's big public sector combined with aging turtle. Aging turtle monopolized uh, firms. I, you know, Leila Baghdadi came the closest to some of the ideas that I tr I'm trying to uh, suggest, like business to business cooperation, creating business environment. This is missing. So you will not be part of, this is my view, unless this business environment, this regulatory environment, the monopolies, the aging turtles are uh, uh, forced to become, you know, there's room for the young gazelles to develop in this region, you will not be part of the BRI or, uh, you know, uh, value-added chains or anything. So, so I believe it's, and if you look at, you know, if you look at China's growth or Turkey's growth, it's internal liberalization that preceded any, uh, uh, you know, foreign trade, uh, trade links, etc. You need to liberalize and rationalize the domestic economies. And I would really suggest you look at this paper. It's truly a great paper. Okay. Let me, let me complement what you said. Also, there is a new piece which is coming from MIT Development Lab about monkeys and trees, which is really about the product space and the value chain. It's really complement what you are saying. We need to, to grow more trees for that monkey to can hop from one tree to another because the product space is so big and that's also complement about this two things you know so that these are good you know pieces which has been written about the region about how to grow these value chain I really agree with you um, Roberta then I will go for one more no and then I will close Really excellent session. And I had a question for Hafez. Uh, could you elaborate a little bit more on the question of food security? I see it often confused with an idea of food autarky in our region. And our region, as all of us, all of you have mentioned, is the most water scarce in the world. And so we're really speaking potentially to, the, to a great comparative disadvantage uh, to our region. So what do you think about it? What are potential solutions? Thank you. For Noha. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mirza. Um, a, a, a very uh, quick and broad uh, comment after having been coming to a, a ERF co uh, conferences for the last 30 years. Um, what a fan this, this panel just is such an incredibly important uh, example of the fantastic growth in ERF's intellectual contribution to the development of this region, having started out with establishing a brand in macro and microeconomic analysis all the way, all the way to today's discussion on how ERF will contribute to extremely important tragedies of regional uh, conflict, as well as promises, not in peace building, I would say promises in sustainable, inclusive, transparent and accountable development in this region. Have, so uh, this is a fantastic panel, I agree with Roberta, but it actually shows how much ERF has grown and will continue to grow uh, intellectually. Quick two comments. When we talk about the potential for regionalization, whether it is in Hafez's intervention or Bernard's intervention, I would like us to make it clear to the world, any contribution of Israel to the future of this region cannot ha happen until Israel reinvents itself from a colonial settler project, which 
it, it, it currently is, to a state that can deserve to be part of this region. I think we all have to make this comment very clear when we talk about regionalization moving, moving forward. Uh, number two, and finally, um, on the localization piece, everything that was said is very enlightening, but I would like us to start to add the role and responsibility of sovereign wealth funds in the Arab region. They are some among the, mo the, mo the richest sovereign wealth funds in the world. Can we bring that the role into a conversation on regionalization? And finally, the points about the turtles and the monkeys and, and everything else. Let's, let's speak truth to power. It's not only about balancing private sector and state sector. No. The reality of the matter is it's not the public sector enterprises that we have inherited from the socialist era of Arab uh, uh, development. No. We're talking now about very opaque black box state institutions that have to open up as well as balance their engagement in the economy with that of the private sector. It's a different kind of state than the one we had before. Let's speak truth to power and it's opaque and unaccountable, unaccountable. Thank you. Thank you. You have very, very good questions and, and the water issues. Hafid. It's on. Uh, <coughs> okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah. I, I, first of all, I, I agree with the comment on the turtles and the monkeys and all of that. We can start a zoo here. <laughs> we are in the zoo. <laughs> so, but 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 uh, but but I agree with the substance. <laughs> now, uh, <laughs> now on on food security, and uh, <coughs> it, it's it's a big topic, and obviously, I uh, it is very different from uh, fu uh, from self uh, sufficiency. Uh, anybody who looks at the region in two minutes will tell you self-sufficiency is a crazy concept for the for this region uh, uh, what what uh, and we did a lot of work when I was at FAU actually on food security uh, in the MENA region what does what does it involve uh, well it involves actually something that Bernard talked about uh, which is uh, 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 what uh, joint work on water uh, so you, you you need to uh, uh, work on, on the wat water issue. You need also, when, when we talk about water, uh, it's not just investing in desalination plants and, and, uh, and in uh, drip irrigation and all of that. It is also uh, 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 changing uh, policies uh, and regulations because policies and regulations in, in the region lead to overconsumption of water. Uh, and, and we need to be much more careful about the way uh, water is being used. Uh, so, second, uh, research. Uh, if you look at the, uh, this region, the amount being spent on research on on uh, on agriculture uh, relative to the agriculture GDP is very very low. Uh, I, I don't have the numbers right here, but I remember like I compared it to Brazil. It is like one third of what Brazil is spending, and I'm not talking about. Uh, uh, new research, primary research, but enough research to be able to use what is being done in other parts of the world and applying it to, to the region. And, and, and you can uh, actually enhance uh, the uh, uh, productivity uh, because we have very, very low productivity in, in, parts, uh, in, in parts of the region. So that is on the production side, the water, the research, and so on. But then you, you, ne you need to look at uh, uh, cross-border investments. Uh, there are countries in the region where, where, where you can invest more in agriculture. Sudan, if, if you can, uh, uh, Somalia. Uh, but th then beyond the region, we need to diversify sources of imports. Why, why not invest in East Africa, uh, in, in South Asia? Now, when we talk about investment, uh, uh, you have to be careful to avoid what happened in 2007-2008, land grab. You actually uh, investing in agriculture outside of the region does not require buying land. 
you, you should not buy the land. Uh, if you go to Africa and agree with the government that you buy a piece of land, the government tells you nobody owns it. It's not true. Every inch of land in Africa is owned. Maybe there is no title, but, uh, the, but you can work with the local communities, help them uh, do outgrower schemes, different kinds of schemes to, to uh, uh, and ensure a supply, uh, the uh, import from there. Uh, finally, uh, f uh, f uh, so I mean, right now we have a country like Egypt where 75% of all its imports of wheat and flour comes from Ukraine and Russia. So if there is a shock there, you need to diversify. Uh, you, 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 lots of things, but for example, uh, you can think of a, 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 a regional uh, uh, st uh, stock emergency stock, not a regulatory stock. But, uh, but emerging stock. So there are many, many things that can be done. And it, so it, it is not just about increasing food production, but it's also about uh, 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 diversifying your sources of imports, about, uh, 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 about, uh, about having a, a kind of security uh, buffer. And finally, on, on the last point, uh, and it was mentioned, I think you mentioned it uh, w w when you showed the, uh, uh, the increase in non-communicable diseases in the region, you, you also need to change uh, policies on subs uh, we, su we subsidize carbohydrates, oils, and sugar. And then we're surprised when people have diabetes and heart disease. So that too is something that uh, we need to uh, tackle. Uh, very, very quickly, I, 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 uh, uh, I, I agree with uh, Noah's point on Israel needs to in reinvent itself, uh, uh, and we need to push for that, uh, and w we need to develop the Palestinian state uh, and push for it, because uh, th that would be peace, peace uh, would be very important, and it can only happen if the Israelis see the light, or see the reason, which might be a, a few years down the road still. Uh, uh, and also, you're absolutely right on the state institutions, wealth funds, and uh, Majid knows much more about that than I do. Shirin. One minute, Ma one minute, you know, because I'm, I took all the coffee break, you know, time, you know, so uh, straight we're going to go to the next session. Okay, Majid, and I will close. No, it's just the, uh, the, the question on the role of uh, SWFs. And this is very important, and I think the, the ERF, one in one of the uh, conferences, had to take the, uh, up this. Most of the investments of the sovereign wealth funds of the region, something like 90 percent, are outside the region. And it is uh, uh, time for them to gear their investment into uh, the region and refrain from investments in property. <laughs> This is my own uh, view because this is, you know, high return in some uh, areas and it's very speculative and it's really not good for the country, for the countries. Uh, but there are sectors in the region, in agriculture, in carbon trading, in uh, the new economy, in uh, solar, wind, hydrogen, and so on, that are good for the economies of the owners of this uh, sovereign wealth funds, and they're good for the global economy, for the green economy. So uh, to gear their investments, a, a good part of their investment into the region, I think it's, it's uh, very important. Great. Thank you very much, uh, colleagues. Thank you for my panelists, uh, Hafez, Bernard, Majid, Leila, and Ariane. Thank you very much, and uh, it was really interesting. Thank you.